This project is a big collaboration between lots of different organisations, particularly Kingborough, Bruni Farming, Ten Lives, um, State Government, um, Parks, and of course SeaTac and Weedapuna. Actually, across the globe, cats have contributed to about one quarter of bird, mammal and reptile extinctions. Um, and in Australia, annually, they kill about two billion native animals, which is a pretty incredible number. So that's based on a density estimate and a, um, how many they consume per day. So some stats behind that. On Bruni, big impacts on our seabird colonies um, and of course on juvenile eastern quolls and other wildlife that's so special and makes Bruni, you know, what Bruni Island is. In terms of agriculture, which of course is the, um, you know, the focus of today, uh, they do host a number of parasites and diseases um, that cost or have um, thought to cost Australia about $12 million annually. So that's particularly impacts on sheep farmers. So because of that, the federal government has put money towards managing cats, particularly on offshore islands. Bruni Island is one of one island um, around Australia that is funded for feral cat management. This program builds on a program run by Kingborough Council from 2017 to 2019. Um, it's funded by the feds and that money comes through NRM South to all of these different organisations that then deliver different parts of the project on the ground. Um, the, there's sort of three big parts to it. So domestic cat management, stray cat management. So strays are cats that rely for part of their needs on people. So, you know, that are fed or partially homed by, by people. And feral cat management. So they're the three big parts to the project. And in terms of domestic cat management, the aim of the project is the aspirational aim is that um, everybody, all cats on Bruni are compliant with the Bruni Island Cat Bylaw, which basically uh, has a set of regulations around domestic cats. They have to be contained and microchipped and registered and so on. And that helps manage their impacts on wildlife and on agriculture. So what is Toxo? And it's, it's a little single celled organism. It's not a bacteria, it's not a virus. It's, a, it's, like, it's the smallest animal you can have. It's just got one single cell. Um, the main host is the is cat family and in other countries you might have tigers and things but here in Australia um, it's always the domestic cat um, and most warm-blooded animals can be what we call the intermediate host and I read a paper the other day talking about how bats can get um, toxo and, and birds can get toxo. We, we've found a lot of the crows, that you, you know, if you ever see a crow cool on the side of the road, they're pretty smart crows. Uh, if you find one dead, usually they've, they've actually got toxo from eating um, carrion on the side of the road and it affects their brain and they can't get out of the road of the car quickly enough. So that's the life cycle. Um, humans are a bit of a sort of a, um, well, really they're no different from any other, other sort of species, but um, the cat, of course, mostly things that can catch little little birds and and mice and things like that. Um, they the cat passes the the eggs or the oocytes in the, in the feces, infects these little guys. Uh, they get tissue cysts there. The cat eats the, the animal and it starts a cycle over again. And you know, production animals can get infected. Humans can get infected. And of course, the cat can get infected by eating these guys, the meat of sheep or potentially pigs, or whatever, um, just as it can from eating eating the, um, the little birds and rodents. And the other important thing about Toxo is that the, the young cat is usually the contaminator. And they usually get infected as soon as they start to hunt or to start to eat sheep and wildlife carcasses. Um, they excrete millions of these little eggs in the faeces, but only for a fairly short time, for about, you know, um, sort of probably two or three weeks. But the thing that does the damage, especially in the cooler, um, more overcast climates like ours, is that the cysts, or the little eggs, live in the environment for a very long time. So you only need that one young cat in, you know, to, to lay down a good lower layer of, of those eggs and they'll be there for, uh, for quite a long time. And you only need 
a handful of those little cysts, only about 10 of them, to infect a, a sheep. So with the farm species, the ones we um, get excited about the most is sheep. Cattle actually are fairly resistant to toxo, and we never diagnose toxo disease in cattle but we certainly do in sheep and pigs and goats. And pigs and goats uh, cause, uh, can cause abortion. Um, but in sheep, it can be a bit invisible. Um, the, if they get infected under 60 days, very often that little tiny fetus, it won't abort, it'll actually just get resorbed or it might become mummified. That means just becomes leathery and, and just sits there in the, in the uterus. And of course, if that happens, the ewe can't get pregnant again. It's like having an IUD, I suppose. Um, so she becomes what we call barren. She won't breed again. Uh, and that can be quite an impact on the industry. Uh, after day 60, up to day 110, um, the fetus will get infected and they can abort. They can have stillborn lambs or they can have lambs that are born and they're a bit stupid and walk around for a day or two and then die. And there's just weak newborn lambs. We're getting around about 30% of ewes, of older ewes, that have, that have con zero converted. That means they've been exposed sometime during their life. Um, and assuming that, you know, most of the exposures, we know from wildlife that most of the disease occurs in winter when the, when the, the um, sheep are grazing and the wildlife are grazing close to the ground, maybe pushing into areas where they don't normally go and and the, those little eggs, the oocysts, are surviving really well in winter because it's, it's overcast, there's no <clears throat> ultraviolet light and there's plenty of moisture. We know that most of our disease occurs just about the same time when most of those ewes are pregnant. So I've been, I think, fairly conservative and I'm just saying, OK, let's say only 1% of ewes around Tasmania every year, on average, you know, if you took some of those ones I showed you before where they lost 62%, there would be others that lost a lot of others who lost nothing. But there'd be others that lost one or two, five, six, you know, just averaging it out. I don't think it's unreasonable to say probably 1% might be affected under 60 days and they have a, end up with a barren ewe with no lamb and maybe about 1% uh, at 60 to 100 days and, and, and lose the lamb, but the ewe rebreeds later. Um, assuming a lamb marking percentage of 100%, a lot of merino flocks do worse than that, a lot of our crossbred flocks do far better than that. Average lamb price, $150. You know, some people are selling lambs at the moment closer to $200, but others are selling them for less than that. So just, just taking those figures. Um, and if you have a, a barren ewe, you sell her. Mutton prices are pretty good. You can get a fair bit of money for her, but then you've got to replace it with a young ewe. So to cross over, replacing that barren ewe, probably about 100 bucks. So if you look at it over 100 ewes, it's probably costing you $400, probably $4 per ewe. There's about 1.5 million breeding ewes in Tasmania. So you're coming out with, a, you know, possibly from Toxo alone, possibly somewhere in ballpark $6 million. A lot of our wildlife, wombats, um, paddy melons, um, and even, even um, Bennett's wallabies, and I've even seen forester kangaroos, uh, a, lot of our wallop, a lot of our bandicoot species, highly susceptible to toxoplasmosis. So if you're seeing signs in your wildlife, chances are that your ewes are being exposed at the same time. And then to mention humans, um, and humans can also be infected. You saw that life cycle earlier on. Um, the classical things are cleaning litter trays or gardening, um, but um, I think the, the infection rates in, in farming people are quite high. Obviously we're out there dealing with lambing ewes, helping the ewe to give birth and handling the placenta, all that sort of stuff. You can easily get exposed if you're working on a sheep farm. And that's another little thing that we, we keep saying to people. If you have female staff working on your sheep and you have an abortion outbreak, try and keep your female staff from handling any aborted use. And the other thing that's really interesting, there's been quite a bit of work done on human infections, often like, okay, in, in, in humans, um, pregnant females, if they get infected, it has a really bad effect on the, on the developing fetus. And they, can, they can abort or they can have ch a child that's born with deformities and, and um, 
uh, intellectual you know, damage to the brain, basically. Um, but they, there's some work that's been done that's, that's, that um, indicates that people that get infected, um, that it, you know, if they get cysts in their brain, that it affects their, their, um, their mental capacity uh, and makes them more likely to take risk behaviours. Uh, you know, they find a lot more young fellows who drive their cars too fast and crash them. Uh, a lot more of those will have cysts in their brain from young people same age that die of other causes. Um, and um, with the high rates of, um, you know, and, and, that, and that's important on a farm. You're using tractors, using heavy machinery, all sorts of dangerous things. You don't want somebody on your farm that's taking risks with, um, with that sort of machinery because, you, you know, it um, can be very serious outcomes. And just quickly on detection, um, we, with, with adult sheep, we, we just generally use a blood test and um, we, you know, we just measure the antibodies to the bug and if, it, if the levels are high, we think it's had a, a recent infection. The levels are low, we think the infection's further back in, in history. Um, and the lambs, um, if we suspect it in lambs, we, we try to collect um, some, some lambs. So we like five lambs. Not everyone here is a farming person, but um, five lambs to the laboratory with the placenta if we can find them. And the lab there, if the lamb has not drunk milk, then we can do an antibody test, and if it uh, otherwise we, we look, we do sections and we look microscopically at the tissues there, and we look for these particular little this, the actual um, it was cyst in the, a little cyst in the brain, so we can look for that and diagnose it that way. Um, in the cat, it's very hard to detect a, a, a cat that's excreting, so. Um, we, we can certainly, like the sheep, we can take a blood sample and, 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 and tell a cat that's been exposed. And generally, that means that the cat is unlikely to become infected again and to excrete a lot of bugs. And, and I have done programs on farms where, um, you know, I had a lot of cats around the place. We, we went and trapped them all um, and kept the cats that had antibodies and just desexed them. Uh, and left them, you know, to, to control the mice or whatever around the farm um, and, um, and then euthanised all the ones that were negative because we knew they were quite susceptible. If they got infected, they would spread <coughs> the oocysts or the eggs all around and infect the sheep. Okay, we talk about Sarco now. <coughs> it's another little single cell parasite, a very small one-celled animal. Um, this one differs from, Sarc uh, from Toxo in that it has got a very strict two host cycle, like the, 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 the cat is the, the predominant host and excretes the, the little oocysts or eggs in the manure, a bit like Toxo, but only the sheep can get infected. So won't infect wildlife, won't infect humans, won't infect anything else, it only can affect sheep. Which means we, we've got a, an added way of controlling the life cycle there because if we can stop cats from eating sheep meat, we can break the life cycle. There's a couple, of, a couple of different types here. We do get a type of sarco in dogs, um, but it's microscopic and we don't even see it. And it doesn't, oh, I think I've seen one sheep once that got some cysts in the brain and went a bit funny, but it's not really economically important or, or important to human health. So that's the life cycle. Um, the, the sheep, um, has a cyst in the muscle, they're little white things like a white grain, a little rice grain. If the cat eats that, sh that sheep meat with that little cyst in it, it'll hatch inside the sheep and the sheep, the cat will get infected, pass all the eggs in its, in its manure and of course if that sheep eats that contaminated grass then it can get infected as well. And the cysts, you know, if, that sh if a sheep dies, um, or if, or if someone kills a sheep and, and, you know, whenever you slaughter a sheep, there's, there's little trim bits and bits and pieces that you, like the head maybe and the feet that you might put in the offal pit, um, any of that sort of tissue. Uh, usually the cyst in the muscle only stays infected for about between 4 and 14 days, depending on the temperature. Um, cats, after they eat that, um, that cyst in that meat, about 10 days later they can start, you know, producing... Some, um, some eggs 
Uh, they don't produce as many eggs as, the, as the toxa, only about 7,000 eggs or cysts um, per gram of faeces every day, but it goes on for a lot longer. Um, the other interesting thing is that we normally detect sarco in sheep just by visual inspection of carcasses, and the sheep don't show. You can't actually see those little white cysts in the, in the muscle um, until probably uh, almost a year after they've been infected. And so any cat can be a contaminator. Unlike the toxo, um, they, 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 it's not like measles. It's a bit more like COVID. You know, you can get COVID and then three or four months later, you can get COVID again. And cats are a bit like that. They can get sarco, excrete the cysts for a while. Um, then they can go and, and, and pick it up again later. So, they, um, so they, it's a different excretion pattern. And there's the little cysts in the muscle, in the sheep, um, very common in the diaphragm. The diaphragm's a muscle that does a lot of work in your body and has a big blood supply. Um, the little cysts end up in that, in that um, tissue quite often. Um, and the food pipe, the esophagus, and, and even the skeletal muscles. And the skeletal muscles are important because even though this is not, won't cause any disease in humans, um, it's a blemish on the muscle and if someone saw it in the butcher's shop they would not want to eat that meat. They would say it's, it's something wrong with it, it's got a cyst in it, you know, it's something abnormal. So, um, the, you know, you can't use that, that meat for, for um, retail. Every month for mutton, that's adult sheep over two years of age, um, between 6 and 16% of those carcasses will have these little white blemishes and the uh, abattoir has to do something about that. If, if there's less than five, they'll just trim them out. But <clears throat> if there's uh, more than that, then they'll condemn the whole carcass. So if you add that up, on average, it adds up to about 2.3 kilograms. We've done a study and they've shown there's about, on average, about 2.3 kilograms of um, of loss of meat per affected carcass. So of those six or to 16%, each of those sheep on average loses 2.3 kilograms. So some will be condemned, some will be trimmed. So I've worked it out for our, we've got one, one sheep abattoir in Tasmania, you know, probably around $90,000 lost in, in, in 12 months. So that's quite significant. Spread over, you know, quite a lot of sheep, but it's a, a loss that we'd rather not have. So the diagnosis in sheep, we just, just see the little white cysts at slaughter. Um, in the cat, it's once again very hard to diagnose um, and there's no antibody test like Toxo either. So um, it's, it's a lot harder to tell how many cats out there are running around with it and because they don't get immune, um, we just regard every cat as a, as a risk. When you think about the life cycles, um, and how to try and break those life cycles, then, you know, really, because, especially with Toxo, which is, is causing the major loss, we're thinking $6 million versus maybe $100,000 um, per annum to the sheep industry. Um, the only way to stop, you know, on bigger sheep properties, it's impossible to clean up every carcass. It's, um, you know, you just can't do it. Sheep will die. Um, It'll be a couple of weeks before you go past that particular spot in the paddock and say, oh, there's a dead sheep. Um, so um, the only way really to get rid of um, sarco is to really, you know, is to eradicate the cats. And there's been a bit of research done which basically shows that if just this farm here decides to eradicate cats and, you know, works really hard on, on getting rid of their cats, they'll simply be reinvaded from the side, usually with young cats, that are bred up in this area next to it. Um, and of course, you know, they're weaned, they have to find new territory. So they go to where, you know, there's, a, there's some territory here that's not being used because someone's removed a, an old cat. So they'll move into it. And of course, they're much more likely to be excreting. And interestingly enough, each of those four properties that I showed you that had massive outbreaks of toxo, each and every one of them had a cat control program. And what we think happened was because they, they created a vacuum and drew in some, some young, uninfected cats 
initially, <coughs> some, some non-immune cats, and then they got infected and, and contaminated their pastures. And of course, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, we can get rid of the feral cats, but we've also got to control the domestic cats. Of course, the Toxo and Sarko don't care whether the cat is feral or if the cat is an owned cat. Um, the thing you can control with your, your owned cats is not to feed them sheep meat. Um, even with Sarko, uh, if freezing won't kill the bugs, with Toxo it will, but, but we don't even want Sarko, so um, you know, just freezing and thawing, a lot of farmers do that with sheep meat, um, <clears throat> that's not going to work. So yeah, you've really got to try and you know, keep those cats in, uh, stop them getting at sheep meat. That's, you've got to try and break that, that um, life cycle at that point. Um, and prompt and secure disposal of sheep carcasses. There's a lot of good reasons to get to, to stop um, cats and other things getting at your sheep carcasses. Um, I'll cover in the next slide. And of course, you know, do not feed raw or frozen sheep meat, any sorts of sheep meat to your cats. And then dead pits. And this is something that um, Mahalia and I became experts on, 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 on dead pits. <laughs> Every farm has, you know, you've got livestock, you've got dead stock. Everyone has a few animals that die. In the best of, you know, the best of managed farms, there's still some that die. Um, and a lot, too many farms that just have an open pit and just throw them in. And they've become, you know, we started calling them cat McDonald's. Um, then we realised, no, it was really um, Uber for cats because, you know, the farmer bought the food to them. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's other things there. Um, if dogs get into those, those pits, they, there's another, other diseases of sheep, which we find that very similar to Sarko, where there's carcass blemishes, sheep measles, bladder worm. They're, they're when dogs get access to sheep um, um, sort of tissue and hydatids. We used to have a lot of hydatids in Tasmania. We don't have it anymore, but it could come back if we don't control access to sheep offals. Um, and, and blowflies, they, they need a, a protein meal before they can breed and, and that's a perfect place. And crows, crows also breed up um, and they can cause a lot of, they often pick the eyes out of, out of, um, out of sheep when they're down. Um, they breed up when there's lots of food. So we need to cover up those dead pits and stop all of those pest sort of animals getting access to food source. Um, so we, I've just sort of had a few ideas about ways that farmers can do that in a, you know, a convenient and cost-effective way. Talking about uh, dead pits yep. and uh, restricting cats' access to carcasses. Yeah. Um, is there sort of like a standard depth that you're talking about? Because I'm assuming I know that bowls can dig holes and. Yeah, it, it, we usually work on about 500 millimeters. Yeah. You know, if you can get something half a meter underground. Um, generally that's, that's enough to stop most things from digging down. Some people have told me that, that devils might be able to burrow down that far, um, but I'm pretty sceptical about that. And it depends on the design of your pit as well. I mean, if you, you, know, if you have a, a fairly narrow trench and, and you fill it with fairly soft material, I, I don't think they'll be able to spread, you know, they might be able to dig down, but I think the sides would keep collapsing collapsing in on them. Farmers are busy. Um, a lot of them have do have backhoes. And that's why I like the, the narrow pit idea. And then we, we call it a, a D1 bulldozer, a shovel. You know, if you, if you sort of have all the dirt piled up there, it's not a big job. You know, you drop a, a sheep in there and if it just fits in nicely, um, you can put a, put, a, you know, put a layer of dirt over it with a shovel fairly quickly. Yes. Yeah. The, big, the big problem with burning, I find, is that a lot of them will, you know, during the summer when, when there's a fire ban, they'll just chuck everything up on the log heap. And, you know, and, and then the dogs and cats and everything will go and just feast on them. Um, and, then, and then you get that window, you know, spring or autumn where there's no fire ban and the wood's not too wet, too wet to burn and they'll burn it. And then in winter, the wood's too wet. So once again, you've just got these carcasses sitting up there and you'll, sometimes you'll find the cats are living in the log heap uh, and, and just, you know, 
breakfast time, all they do is you know go up two stories, <laughs> away they go. So um, yeah, burning is doesn't seem it's not a year-round solution. Composting is a good option. I think a lot of pe more people should think about composting. Um, it certainly works, and and you know after two or three days, the, those those carcasses uh, get to really high temperatures and break down into terrific compost. And um, and also you know once once they heat up, you know six, they get up 60, 70 degrees. That'll kill all the kill all those bugs pretty fast. So um, just a matter of having something on hand, um, you know some sawdust or um, you know some some vegetation you put through a through a, a mulching machine or something like that to to to, um, to lay and put down a bed of about 500 mils of of material and then you, and then you just pile stuff up stuff up, up over the top of them and there's, there's plenty of good um, documentation of how to do it it's just it's just having the right um, mulch or the right vegetation the carbon source to to lay over the carcasses. So we had two real goals in mind when we were starting this project. It's changed a little bit due to COVID, but um, we still kept strong with our aims. And so we wanted to look at how livestock management practices impact disease prevalence of toxo and sarco. And we also wanted to look at the relationship between disease prevalence and cat density. Our statistical methods identified three main factors which influence the prevalence of teak on the eye on a property, so toxo on a property. We have the region, so whether the property is in the Midlands or on Bruny Island. We have the frequency with which cats are observed in sheep paddocks, and here's one of our photos from our camera traffic. And whether cats can access raw sheep meat. So starting with region, you can see that the prevalence in the Midlands over here is much higher than the prevalence on Bruny Island. This is of toxo. So we had a prevalence of toxo at around 31% in the Midlands. And then on Bruny Island, it was around 4.5%. Now this is really interesting because this prevalence in the Midlands is basically the same as the national average that was estimated by Meat and Livestock Australia. So that tells us that in the Midlands, cats are pretty much acting like they do everywhere else in Australia. But on Bruny Island, probably due to cat density being a lot lower, we have a lot less toxo on Bruny overall. And so, yeah, we just think that it's not necessarily anything to do with the region in particular. It might be, but we really think that this difference is seen because there's differences in cat density. So then we go on to the cat spotting frequency in paddocks. So you can see that on properties where farmers reported seeing cats on a sub-yearly basis, so that's where they said they saw cats maybe once a month or even some of them once a day. There's a lot more toxo, a lot higher prevalence than there is on properties that said that they only saw cats maybe once a year. But the problem with this is having a small sample size all of the properties that said that they saw cats on a sub-yearly basis were in the Midlands, and all of the ones that saw it on a yearly basis were in Bruny Island. So this really didn't tell us anything more. We were hoping it would, but yeah, we, we didn't really have any difference between the regions, and so this could just be due to the regional differences. Our third risk factor, whether cats can consume raw sheep meat, we basically had properties where cats could consume raw sheep meat, which is from carcasses in paddocks or in uncovered offal pits. We had much higher levels of T. gondii on these properties where cats can access sheep carcasses than those that didn't. However, again, we had pretty small number of people in the end working with us. So only two of the properties actually restricted access via these methods, carcasses left in paddocks and in offal pits. And these are both on Bruny Island where cat density is lower and disease is lower. So again, love to do this again and see if we can get better results, but we don't, we didn't have, we only had 10 properties. And so we think that since consumption of sheep meat isn't really that important in transmission of toxo, we suspect that accessing raw sheep meat really just increases the food available to cats, especially in times like winter where 
birds and mice and rats aren't breeding as well and prey might be harder to find. And in this way, it might sustain slightly larger cat populations on these properties. We also expect that this is more important for Sarko, since Sarko does rely on cats eating sheep meat and then sheep meat, sheep being exposed to the cat defecation. But none of the properties that we had Sarko data for actually did restrict access to raw meat, so we couldn't test it. So through camera trapping, we uncovered evidence that cats breed around uncovered offal pits. This is one of our photos, and this was left here for a month. And I can tell you, I've looked at all the pictures, you just see these young cats, and you see mum coming to and from to go hunt other stuff that's more exciting. They sit here, they play with each other here, they sleep on the nice comfy wool. This is just their little smorgasbord. So this is important. Cats breeding around offal pits is really important because less than 1% of cats are actively shedding tea gondi at any time. As Bruce said, it's only usually the juvenile cats. So it's only upon initial infection that they produce these oocysts in big numbers. And this is rarely seen in cats over six months old. So places like this, where cats are breeding, are probably much more contaminated with T. gondii than other areas of the farm. So I just had a few important things about toxo in humans, because it's so interesting. So people who live on farms are more frequently exposed to T. gondii than the general population. And this is true for really a lot of different countries. There's lots of research that's been done and it really points that people on farms tend to be more exposed. This is probably because farming, farmland is a really good place for Tea Gondi Yard to be spread. We can just see lots of transmission, lots of livestock getting sick, and this seems to just have everything that Tea Gondi Yard needs to be transmitted really well. So you should also know that raw or undercooked meat can infect consumers if these cysts are consumed. It's not the best way from the perspective of toxo, but it does happen. And one study in South, South Australia estimated that 43 to 68% of lamb mint samples in the supermarkets were contaminated with T. gondii. And when we have estimates like that, this is probably why worldwide we have roughly one in three people infected with toxo. So another interesting thing to note is that seropositivity of the livestock, so this is whether livestock tests positive or negative for toxo, it has little association with the actual risk that it poses. So animals like pigs, sheep and goats typically harbour many more of these cysts than animals like cattle and horses maybe. We had two main risk factors for sarco. So we had distance from nearest town, and whether cats were observed around shearing sheds. So we're starting off with distance from nearest town. We found that for every kilometre you move away from the nearest town, the prevalence of psychocystis increases by up to 1%. And you can see that some of these properties, again, really didn't have many properties involved, but you can see that this really increases quite rapidly. We think this is because as cats move further from urban areas, they become more reliant on food sources that expose them to sarcocystis. This is mainly sheep carcasses. So something important to note here is that carrion, or animal meat, isn't a favoured food source for cats. They really like their prey alive. And I think anyone who's got a pet cat will know that they would much rather catch a rat than eat their tin food. So one study in New Zealand found that scavenged sheep, where obviously there's lots of sheep, made up only 7% of the diet of feral cats. So, but cats in low quality habitat or subordinates are much more likely to eat from sheep carcasses. And so we expect that these guys are more likely to spread psychocystis than dominant cats or well-fed and loved street cats. And important to know is laboratory tests on psychocystis found that freezing temperatures didn't consistently inactivate the cysts. So 
when you see this sheep carcass and it's cold and it's in the dead of winter and you go, surely nothing can be living on that. It could be. And the freezing temperatures might just keep the meat longer for the cats so that they like to eat because they don't really like off meat. Okay, so our second risk factor, whether we have cats observed around shearing sheds. You can see we had a lot of variability in the data, which we still hope to reduce down. But when cats were observed around shearing sheds, they tend to have a larger prevalence of sarco than properties that didn't see cats around their shearing shed. This could be about cat density, but we do think that shearing sheds are probably a good area for transmission to occur. So we think these are a great place for transmission to occur because there's lots of things like bits of food hanging around, there'd be lots of rodents, I'm sure, in your shearing sheds. And these attract and localise cats around farm buildings in general. So it's also an area where pretty much every sheep at some point in its life comes through the shearing shed and hangs out in the surrounding paddocks. So also important to note is that sheep tend to be stocked at higher densities in the surrounding paddocks when you're waiting, when you've got your sheep together to go through the shearing shed or you've got your sheep waiting to be released afterwards. It tends to be higher density than in the other areas. So in these areas, the sheep probably eat the grass down lower and cats prefer that for defecating in. And it also is gen generally, like Bruce said, where sheep get infected. And then once it's all, all the contamination has happened, the sheep will move out and they'll carry it on their foot to other parts of the property, or you'll have your heavy machinery moving it and spreading it all around the property. So we can also assert that based on the scientific literature, the way that feed is stored probably has an impact on disease prevalence. We didn't find it, but there wasn't much variability in the answers to our stored feed questions. So stored hay and grain tend to attract things like mice, rats, rabbits and small birds, which are really the favoured prey animals for cats. In fact, rodents in one study made up 50% of feral cats diet by weight. And so usually where a rodent will go, a cat will follow. So if you've got a cat, one study found this, a single cat, and they defecate once in your stored feed, and then it's processed so that it's evenly distributed among the feed, then each kilogram of your stored feed could contain between five and 25 sheep infective doses of T. gondii, toxo. So in this way, we expect that contaminated feed probably disperses T. gondii as well as all these other methods. And this can happen through wild animals eating the contaminated feed and then being killed by a different cat and infecting that cat for the first time. Or you might just have a high concentration of their previd their favoured prey animals around your stored feed, which is drawing cats in and supporting higher, constant, higher cat density. So I had just a few other reasons why there's so much transmission on farms. We have things like areas shared by cats, wildlife and livestock, where they come in really close contact. And this is great for, for transmission of diseases. We have contaminated hay and stored grain, which is especially important in winter, in the cold winter months. We have mice, rats, rabbits and birds attracted to the stored feed, which can then sustain greater populations of cats. We have lower vegetation usually, which can favour dispersal via wind and rain, which we've had plenty of today. We have soil disruption by livestock and machinery spreading that all around the property. We have invertebrates like flies, beetles, worms, which can act as transport hosts and infect things like bandicoots, antichinus, some of these guys who have the highest mortality rates when they have T. gondii infection. We have own cat abandonment supplementing feral populations, which hopefully doesn't happen too much here, but definitely happens all the time in the Midlands. And then we have roadkill all along farm roads, which are keeping these other cats alive, keeping the cat density higher, and also a good option for transmitting toxo back to new cats. So I just wanted to finish on a bit of a scary statistic. So this is one of Bruce's findings on one of his papers. 
he found that one newly infected cat with Toxo is all that's required every 12 to 18 months to maintain contamination of an area. So just one is all you need. And this is really why the feral cat control that's happening on Bruni is so important because one's all it takes. Okay, so just wanted to quickly summarize for everyone. The risk factors we found for T. gondii are region and the frequency cats are observed around sheep paddocks. But these probably both relate to cat density and hopefully when we have our cat density estimates for each property, we'll be able to replace them with our own estimates. And then we also have where the cats can access raw sheep meat, which like we said, probably sustains higher populations of cats, but is probably more important for Sarko, just couldn't be tested. Then for Sarko, we have the distance from nearest town because town cats tend not to eat sheep and sheep tend not to be exposed to farm cats. Usually there's a little bit of a barrier there. And then we also have where the cats are observed around the shearing shed. And we really think that just relates to cats being around farm buildings. It's just not a good idea. <laughs> so I just wanted to quickly say that while this study has uncovered some potentially important findings, um, potentially important risk factors for cat-borne disease on agricultural land, we didn't have that many properties involved. And so we lost a lot of statistical power. Ideally, if someone can pick this up, now they're on the other side of COVID-19, we might get to know a lot more about how transmission of these pathogens can be prevented on agricultural land.